I'm Mary Hagedorn. I'm at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today, so thank you to all the organizers. Um, I, I first started thinking about the Earth um, in grammar school because we would watch early space explorations on television in grammar school. And I actually never really figured out how this worked because it was an inner city Catholic grammar school that barely had money for gym and lunch, as far as I could tell. I don't know where they got the money for uh, t televisions in every classroom, but it really got me fascinated with space. And this image that um, Bill Enders took, Apollo 8, 8 astronaut of Earth rise from the moon, really changed my view of the world. Um, I never understood really how incredibly beautiful the world was. And um, I, I, every time I see you know, the, the, the incredible images from space of, of the Earth, it just, it just inspires me because it is so incredibly beautiful. Um, our, today, our, our lust and our greed for fossil fuels is changing our world in ways we can't even anticipate in, for the future. And it, one of the things that sort of keeps me up at night is wondering how the people and the animals that are going to come after me will live on this earth and whether the beauty that we see on the earth now will still exist. Um, so one of the, you know, obviously taking on a whole planet in terms of conservation is a bit beyond, uh, is more like Star Trek and, and uh, Star Wars. And I, I tried to limit my, my interest to just saving coral reefs. And that's what we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the question I wanted to pose to you today is, can someone who has some rather unorthodox ideas about conservation really help save coral reefs? And um, we'll see what you think at the end. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about why coral reefs are important and what they do for us. 50% um, of our oxygen, we live on an ocean planet, 50% of our oxygen comes from the ocean. It does, and um, our uh, coral reefs are one of the most important ecosystems in our ocean. A quarter of all animals that live in our ocean at some point live on a coral reef. So there are major nurseries for our oceans. They're also important for, our, for our, our cities and our homes. I live very close to a coral reef, and, and, a, and a, um, we get tsunamis in Hawaii. And I am very grateful for that barrier reef that protects my house. They're also important for antibiotics and new pharmaceuticals that um, places like NIH are, are looking at, because they've been around for millions of years and have chemical defenses, much like um, trees do in our forests. The at least 500 million people um, depend on them for their livelihood, whether it's fishing or tourism, et cetera. So they're really important in terms of our economy, especially since about $350 million, um, or sorry, billion um, annually comes from coral reefs. But the, the global problem, and I'm, there, are, there, are, there are local problems, but I'm, I'm going to speak mostly about the global problems. The global problems is that every single coral reef on Earth is under siege. No matter where it is, whether it's near people or not near people, it is being affected by global climate change. And, and part of it is our, uh, our greed for fossil fuels producing carbon emissions that both warm our oceans and cause acidification of our oceans that leads to coral stress, coral bleaching, coral disease, and potentially death. And so this, this triage or this, this horrible sort of uh, cascade of events can happen to coral, especially when they're, um, they're, they're stressed by local um, uh, things like pollution and sedimentation, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we do know, that if coral reefs start to fail, hunger will increase. Because so much of our population, one-seventh of our population, depends on fish for food. And, f and without coral reefs, fish decline. Here's the, the really bad news. Um, Two-thirds of the Great Barrier Reef is dead or in danger of dying today. I, a year ago, I never would have said that, but it's, it's astonishing to think about that almost 1,000 kilometers of our Great Barrier Reef is now under siege, and um, it happened quickly. Uh, the, it's been stressed, but it, it happened very quickly. So the question is, what can we do about this? How can we move forward and be um, optimistic about this? So um, a, a baby is probably an odd transition to, to, to go from 
smokestacks and dying coral and climate change. But it's, you know, it's an image of uh, hope. It's an image of uh, sort of the, the future. And it's also what we, we, we do at the heart of our science. We use human fertility techniques to save coral reefs. And um, we know that about 5 million people on Earth have, have been created um, with um, in vitro fertilization. And um, we're using exactly those sem same techniques for, um, for our work. Now, when you look at, um, at cryopreservation or the freezing of um, human gametes, it started out with sperm, because sperm is relatively small and easy to cryopreserve. And um, then came, that, and that was in the 1960s, and then in the 80s we had human eggs, or sorry, human embryos, um, and then not until about 2000 did we get really good cryopreservation of human eggs. A lot of that has to do with them being bigger, eggs and embryos bigger, and eggs are much more complicated than embryos. They have a lot of eggs in them, a lot of yolk in them, and they're just harder to freeze. So when we cryopreserve something, it is with the idea that we can safely freeze it and thaw it. And we introduce a cryoprotectant, which is an antifreeze chemical, and um, we try to avoid ice crystals, which you see in this picture here. Um, and it is, it is the avoidance of ice crystals that is critical in um, uh, safe cryopreservation. And we do this experiment all the time at home. You get, if you, put, you wrap your meat or your vegetables or whatever it may be, insufficiently, you'll go, the freezer will go through thaw and freezing cycles that will produce ice crystals that give you freezer burn. And it, it becomes unpalatable at that point. So it's very similar to da the damaging um, actions that happen during um, bad cryopreservation. But what I want you to think about in terms of cryopreservation is that it's, and what we, we are doing it with it is that we are doing something similar to a seed bank. We're creating a repository using human fertility techniques to cryopreserve coral and, and, and for the future. And it's very similar to a seed bank. Seed, seeds can last for tens to hundreds to even thousands of years. And uh, frozen tissue that's well maintained can do the same. We use seeds to, um, okay, we use seeds to enhance um, our, our ecosystems, and we can use them to bring back extinct species. This is exactly what we can do for, with frozen repositories as well. So um, coral, I, I just put the pandas up here, um, mostly to show that pandas uh, you, uh, reproduce in a very restricted amount of time, as do coral. Coral only um, reproduce for about two nights a year, and it's 40 minutes each night. So we have a very restricted time to work on them. So what can we do, and what are the impacts of our cryopreservation? We can freeze coral sperm, and um, we've developed very inexpensive techniques to do that with. We can take that sperm, we can thaw it out, and we can create new coral. You see um, some uh, uh, on the left is from fresh sperm, on the right um, from cryopreserved. They're, they're virtually identical. And now we've banked over 16 species from the Caribbean, Hawaii, and the Great Barrier Reef. And we know that if we can take 35 individuals, we get 90% of the genetic diversity in that area. In, in my laboratory this, this summer, um, we, just, we just successfully cryopreserved fish embryos, which are very large, very similar to human embryos, but a much larger scale, using um, gold nanoparticles and lasers. And the lasers were there to, to, to stop ice crystals from forming. We'll be using that same technology to try and cryopreserve eggs and embryos. And I think we'll be very successful this, this coming summer. These are the kinds of techniques that people want to use if they're going to be doing um, hybridizations, um, selective breeding and doing um, extensive genetic work. They want to be able to mix and match sperm and eggs. The thing that's happening right now is that uh, bleaching is, is impacting reproduction and it is, it is decimating the, the future of our coral and our coral being able to adjust to new conditions. Um, so we're taking a slightly different tact. We're, not, we're, we're trying not to focus on reproduction over the next three years because in the last year, all of our efforts in, in Morea and over repression is, have ended up in, with zero. We got no reproduction um, in, over this last year. 
So we're, we're, we're now freezing the algae inside the cell, inside the coral, that, which are called symbiodinium, and we've successfully cryopreserved those and hope to make a global uh, bank for those because these may help control um, the resiliency of the coral. We're working with Ken Niedermeyer um, and creating offshore nurseries, um, and he, he um, started these in Florida. We're putting them in, in um, Hawaii and Morea. This is what they look like today. They're no longer just these cement blocks. Uh, but these nurseries are causing corals to grow faster, and they're reproducing enormously in the East Nursery. So they're really an, an extraordinary tool and we're making them for Morea. But then finally, we're working with Moat Marine Lab and Dave Vaughn there, and they're making these tiny little microfragments. And um, the microfragments, we can get them down to one polyp. We've already successfully cryopreserved fragments of coral. We need to enhance it and make it so that it's, it's conservation ready. But we hope to, to put these, these microfragments, grow them out quickly um, on the coral trees. So we're going to be putting both reproductive material and these microfragments. If we can get the microfragments to really work um, in terms of a conservation practice, we will no longer be hemmed in by two days a year. We can, we can go through the, the, the um, reefs quickly, identify the number of individuals that we have, and know the genetic material that we have. And we can train people very quickly to do this. So I, we think that this is going to be a really an amazing tool for um, successfully trying to maintain the biodiversity of reefs. So I told you coral reefs are, are in trouble. We have this um, amazing bank that we're forming that we hope people will start using today, but will be there for tomorrow if, if in 500 years, the oceans are, you know, have returned to pre-industrial conditions. And we're hoping, though, that today these important tools that are ex situ conservation, or however you want to think of them, can be incorporated into the conservation strategies for larger um, conservation actions like half the planet conservation, whatever it is. Um, but um, so because we think we can maintain the biodiversity of coral reefs. So I'll leave you with this. Um, quote from E.O. Wilson, who I think it's the heart of everything that we're doing, and acknowledge my funders. Thank you.